The Colosseum in Rome is one of the most notable and impressive feats of architecture in the history of the world. Opened in the year 80 CE by the Emperor Titus, the arena was used to stage gladiator combat, skirmishes with wild animals, and even mock naval battles with actual boats. The unknown architects behind its design put extensive thought into every detail. If you've ever wanted to construct your own amphitheater of death, then this is your lucky day, because Today, we're going to take a look at how the Romans built the Colosseum. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other historical sites you would like to know more about. Do you want, you want to, to be, be entertained? entertained? Okay, okay, let, let the, the video, video begin. begin. In 64 CE, Emperor Nero built himself a home which he humbly nicknamed the Golden Palace. Clearing the land necessary for construction meant seizing property from numerous ordinary Romans, which, as you might imagine, wasn't a super popular move. After Nero died, the empire quickly cycled through four other corrupt emperors. Then, in 69 CE, Vespasian seized power. Looking to reverse the damage Nero and his successors had done to the Roman people's faith in government, Vespasian lived a more modest lifestyle and aggressively advocated for Rome's citizenry. It was around 70 CE when Vespasian promised to build a public amphitheater which would hold gladiator tournaments. In a politically symbolic move, Vespasian chose to build this arena directly on the site of Nero's Golden Palace. In 80 CE, after 10 years of construction, Vespasian's son, Emperor Titus, would finally open the Colosseum. The venue was inaugurated with a festival that boasted 100 days of games. Vespasian chose to have the Colosseum constructed on what was once the site of a lake in the Garden of Nero's Golden Palace. The construction would require drainage 26 feet beneath the surface to divert rivers and streams that flowed from the nearby hills. It would also mean the concrete foundations of the Colosseum would have to run extra deep to prevent collapse. Dirt that was dug out of the ground to make space for the large foundation was repurposed to build up the land around the structure. This elevated the Colosseum 23 feet above ground level, forcing crowds to look up at, rather than down on, the building. Don't rush off to see for yourself, though. Due to changes in the landscape, in modern times, the Colosseum sits level with the ground. The blocks of travertine stone used in the construction of the Colosseum were quarried in a place called Albulae, located near what today is the town of Tivoli. The site of the quarry was about 20 miles from the site of the Colosseum, so transporting the blocks wouldn't be easy. To help things along, the Romans built a road specifically for the purpose of moving the stone from the quarry to the construction site. Each cartload contained 30 to 50 stones, and historians estimate workers would have transported roughly 240,000 carts. 20 to 30,000 people would have been involved in the construction. The majority of them were slaves, The Roman Empire was an innovator in the use of concrete to build larger and sturdier structures than had ever been built before. The vaults and arches of the Colosseum were made from concrete, which allowed the massive building to maintain an open and airy atmosphere, while still being structurally sound. The foundations were also made of concrete. Starting at the outer wall, the foundation was laid out in concentric circles that moved inward toward the arena. The lowest part of the foundation is roughly 42 feet deep, and it becomes shallower as it moves inward. Roman cement was usually made by heating limestone to create calcium oxide, also known as quicklime. Submerging the quicklime in water created a putty that acted as a binding agent in the cement. The unknown architect of the Colosseum wanted the dimensions of the building to reflect a ratio of five to three, which was considered ideal at the time. Indeed, the arena ultimately measured 280 by 168 Roman feet, and the width of the auditorium and arena were equal to the height of the Colosseum. Because of the Colosseum's arches, the perimeter of the amphitheater had to be exact. There were 88 entrance arches, and each had to be 20 Roman feet wide, and have three Roman feet of space between them. For the record, the size of a Roman foot could vary, but generally it was around 11.5 inches. 
construction of the Colosseum started with the arches. Made from sturdy travertine stone, the arches allowed the laborers to start work on both the bottom and top of the structure. Indeed, the upper seating, wooden portico, and walls at the top two floors of the amphitheater were built simultaneously with the lower portion of the building. It was this forward-thinking construction plan that made it possible for the Romans to construct the Colosseum in less than a decade, an absolutely astounding feat for the time. For the safety of the spectators in the front rows, the seats closest to the stage were raised nearly seven feet. In addition, a fence would be placed around the ring to keep wild animals at bay. Made from marble and travertine, these seats were also the most grandly decorated and usually had ceilings adorned with intricate works of art. However, as with many modern sports arenas, as spectators move further up in the stands, the seating would become less ornate and less comfortable. Everyone except the people in the front rows would have been tightly packed in, with maybe one foot of personal space and two feet of legroom. While that does sound cramped, it's actually more space than you get flying American Airlines which isn't saying that much. To remove the waste of humans and animals, the Colosseum required a sewer system. The public bathrooms, or latrines, were a row of holes in the ground dug over a pipe that carried flowing water. Not fancy, but effective. The pipe would then empty into a drain that connected to the city's main sewer, the Cloaca Maxima. The system may have also provided fresh water to the spectators via cisterns placed to the sides of the Colosseum, which drew water from the Aqua Claudia aqueduct. Delivery was accomplished by building lead and terracotta tunnels in the walls of the Colosseum. Within the Colosseum, marble and iron dividers can be found on the staircases. Though historians don't all agree as to their function, some believe that they were intended to keep spectators separated into their proper socioeconomic classes, kind of like the border between the riffraff and the jet set. Hmm, I wonder if there was a jet set before jets. Support for this interpretation lies in the fact that the highest section in the Colosseum, where the poorest members of the audience typically sat, was separated from the rest of the spectators by a 16-foot high wall. This seating at the top of the arena, over 300 feet from the stage, is likely where women and the poor would have been. However, many historians have noted that the five ascending sections in the arena don't correspond with any known division of the number of Roman social classes at the time. This means that if the spectators were seated by social class, it isn't obvious how those classes were segregated. One of the coolest things about the Colosseum was its ability to fill with a few feet of water so that sailors could hold mock naval battles in miniature boats. The transformation, though, was not easy. In order to create the aquatic arena, workers had to remove the amphitheater's floor and wooden supports. The arena would then be flooded with water transported by aqueduct. After it was all over, the Colosseum would be drained through a series of runoff canals. The popularity of these naval skirmishes decreased over time. Eventually, the wooden supports were replaced with masonry walls, which ended the possibility of flooding the floor and having naval battles in the arena. Hypogeum is the Greek word for underground, and the hypogeum is an area beneath the Colosseum that was used for a variety of purposes. Several sections of its walls are carved in unusual ways, and historians spent many years working out the purposes of the various carvings. For example, in the late 1990s, architect Heinz Jürgen Best discovered a set of tracks in the walls of the Hypogeum's hallways and strange diagonal indentations near some of the entrances to the arena. Best eventually concluded that the tracks were likely used to move animal cages through the Hypogeum during events. The diagonal indentations allowed for the placement of ramps that would lead the animals into the arena. Best also theorized that a mysterious series of semicircular cuts in the walls were there to allow for the placement of devices called capstans. The capstans had four rotating arms and could be used to lift heavy animal cages from the hypogeum to the arena floor. The architect found the locations of 60 capstans of this type and another 20 which he believed were used to set up and change scenery. Laborers who worked in the hypogeum received none of the luxuries that the audience took for granted. In summer, the poorly ventilated hypogeum was extremely hot, and in winter, it became cold and damp. It was also incredibly loud. 
the tiny space housed machinery, wild animals, and numerous people who would be shouting to each other. On top of all that, there were organ and drum cues that signaled workers to send up scenery or animals, as well as a boisterous crowd whose footsteps would echo below. For those warm summer days, the Colosseum was equipped with an enormous cloth awning known as Villa, which would be hoisted over the structure to shade spectators. The Colosseum wasn't the only one to use Villa. They were fairly common in ancient Rome, and most amphitheaters and arenas had Villa. The Villa at the Colosseum were rigged similarly to a sail on a ship, making actual sailors the most qualified people to operate it. That being the case, the Colosseum used actual members of the Roman Navy to lift and secure the awning over the crowd. The job was considered a privilege among the sailors, as it meant they would get to see a large city, which most never got the opportunity to do. Sailors in the Roman Navy were typically enslaved young men and boys who had been taken from countries around the world that had been conquered by Rome. They would serve for 15 to 30 years, after which they earned their freedom and Roman citizenship. And you thought student loans were a pain. So what do you think? What impresses you most about the Colosseum? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.